Good afternoon, um, I'm Lega, Director of Education and Culture at the Kurdistan Regional Government United Kingdom representation. I would like to welcome our panelists and attendees to uh, this webinar and wish a very happy International Women's Day to all women around the world. Um, the KRG UK representation is hosting this webinar to mark International Women's Day and also celebrate what the Kurdish women have achieved and discuss how much more must be done to achieve gender equality for women. We will be focusing on a range of matters, including the role of women in different fields in society. This event will explore different themes addressed by our distinguished panelists in senior positions and key businesses in Kurdistan and abroad. Now, I would like to welcome uh, Kakarwan the Karachi High Representative to the UK to deliver a few remarks. Kakarwan, please welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hawar Khan. Um, good afternoon to all and good afternoon to distinguished participants, speakers, and to all attendees who are with us today on this momentous day where we celebrate the Women's International Day in this particular webinar to debate the status of the Kurdish women, their role and participation, as well as uh, the obstacle and challenges that women and girls face. I'm glad that today we will hear from several strong, dedicated and enthusiastic women from different profession and expertise, be it politics, diplomacy, economy, author and academics. It is clear that uh, Kurdish women have been uh, or have seen a crucial role throughout history and always appeared influential in changing and shaping society. This has reflected uh, indeed on the government's plan and strategy in placing significant importance for further enhancing women's role and emphasizing on uh, empowering women. Our representation would very much like to create an open platform for Kurdistani women and girls to showcase their extraordinary effort internationally and to fully paint their feeling and creativity despite the obstacles they face. It is an honor for us to proudly state that we are embracing a set of values that we share with the democratic society and advanced country. Democracy, the rule of law, human right, um, uh, coexisting, and the empowering of women. These values must be protected. This is our choice, and we have to nurture and protect them continuously. Yesterday, uh, we on the world witnessed the historic visit of His Holiness the Pope to Kurdistan region. This visit will powerfully symbolize the pressing need to, in, uh, to enhance social cohesion and peaceful um, coexisting in and between the people and nation of the Middle East. It is also important in further emphasizing the common value and interest we hold that are aligned with our partners globally. Women's right is included indeed, and it is clearly recognized internationally. While I express my profound congratulation to women in Kurdistan and worldwide, I also profoundly appreciate all activists and non-governmental uh, organization who have had overwhelming role in protecting women's rights in Kurdistan uh, and promoting gender equality. Women in Kurdistan have always played a prominent, prominent role in politics and society at different level. They have had an influential role in the struggle. We uh, proudly have a woman with us who was uh, Peshmerga uh, during the revolution era, uh, that she continue the struggle now on different level within the institution. We have strong diplomat, successful entrepreneur and innovative women, women who have been voice of the survivor from conflict zone, and also the advocate and activist from uh, uh, women's uh, right. At the same time, we acknowledge the, uh, the hardship, violation and obstacles the women face. That is partly, in my opinion, caused by the culture of our uh, society, which needs to be continuously confronted. 
also the women themselves, uh, a statistic show that substantial number of, uh, of women uh, avoiding the engagement in different uh, era. As far as the authority and the government concern, I confidently state that the Kurdistan regional government has committed itself uh, 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 publicly and has moral and, uh, and human uh, and institutional obligation to ensure women's rights preserved. Their engagement is widened, uh, the proper ground provided for them to flourish and prosper in all sector. For that, there are several laws and legislation that Kurdistan Parliament has passed, several landmark legislation, including the law against domestic violence, the strategy on uh, uh, combating violence against women, and the uh, personal status law to, uh, uh, to advance gender equality and women's empowerment. So uh, these are all uh, many laws uh, that we can uh, name a lot of them, and I'm sure the panelists will, uh, will elaborate more on that. And also the female representation in parliament has increased from 25% to 30%. Uh, my government and the Kurdish regional government ensure that the government's authority fully respect the right of women uh, and girls. Hence, several measures have been taken uh, by the KRG to implement human rights uh, education in schools and universities as education contribute to promoting equality and sustainable development in the region. And for that, Gender Equality Center has uh, or have been established across the university. We are placing a high priority on promoting equality and human rights to protect individuals' rights and advance equality of opportunity for all. However, despite the positive uh, development we have seen, certain limitation and shortcoming still exist, but the Kurdistan region is committed uh, to eliminating and combating them that will be, and that will be fulfilled with a collective effort. I'm sure we will hear from the panelists a different perspective of women's engagement and the uh, related issues of concern that we all learn and benefit uh, from to further uh, promote women's empowerment. And I uh, shall stop here and once again, uh, happy International Women's Day to all of you and the women in Kurdistan and around the world. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kakarwan, for your kind words. Um, just to provide a brief context of this event, our speakers for the panel will speak for five to ten minutes. Then we will move to a discussion and Q&A afterwards. To contribute to the discussion, you can use Q&A function that is in your Zoom screen. Please type your questions there and we'll come back to you. Um, before we ask our first speaker to speak, um, I would like to share a message of support from Baroness Fiona Hodson, who is a long-standing campaigner on women's issue. She's a party whip in the House of Lords and co-chairs the APPG on Women, Peace and Security. Unfortunately, she was not able to join us today due to her busy schedule. As you all know, uh, today is an important day packed with many events, but she has kindly sent us a message of support. I would like to uh, share her quote with you on the screen. Um, she said, I'm so sorry not to be able to take part in your discussion today. International Women's Day gives us all the opportunity to pause and reflect on how life is for women in all our countries. I well remember my last visit to Kurdistan in 2017 when I met so many remarkable women. I know that many of them have suffered greatly and how hard it's for those who have had to flee from the terrors of war and have become displaced. Empowering women is important for societies everywhere. I hope that your event will emphasize the importance of hearing women's voices and encouraging them to take their place in helping to find solutions to the problems being faced in Kurdistan. Um, I wish you all a very happy International Women's Day. I would like to extend our profound appreciation to Baroness Hodgson for sharing this great message of hope uh, with the Kurdish women. And now I would like to start our panel with the first speaker, Ms. Siham Jabali Maman, who is joining us from Kurdistan. 
Uh, Ms. Siham is a senior advisor at the Department of Foreign Relations of the Kurdistan Regional Government. She has been in leadership position in five successive cabinets and has been a part of the rapidly expanding relations between the KRG and the foreign governments. Uh, Ms. Siam has participated in various programs, courses, workshops related to the field of diplomacy. Um, she played a critical role in the MOU that was signed between DFR and USIP regarding the UN Resolution 1325, and she supervises its implementation. Ms. Siam heads two main committees in the DFR, one to follow up on the implementing the Iraq National Action Plan on UNSCR 1325 in the Kurdistan region and Iraq and the United Nations Universal uh, Periodic Review. Uh, Ms. Siham will talk about women in diplomacy, participation and leadership, how to mobilize the participation of women in the field of diplomacy. Um, Siam, Ms. Siam Khan, please welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liga Khan. Uh, happy International Women's Day and for this beautiful ladies. Uh, <clears throat> let's making women as a matter today. Kakarwan Liga Khan, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, uh, I would like to uh, give a special thanks to Kakarwan and his team for organizing this panel discussion. A special thanks for all participation uh, participants who uh, agreed to participate in this uh, discussion. Thank you for providing this opportunity to discuss this very important topic. In fact, it's an important topic and there are lots of points which can be discussed to enrich this panel. Of course, Kurdistan regional government has come a long way regarding the status of women and the role they have played in political, economic and social aspects of the region. We have witnessed lots of positive changes, yet we have a longer way to go. If we compare Kurdistan today with 10 years or 20 years ago, there has been lots of progress, but this is not the final destination that we want. Women are playing an important role in the universities, in the education sectors, in the health sectors. And recently in the business sectors, you can find them working in the public and private sector. However, we do not have a lot of women in the leading or decision making role until yet. Therefore, while we have uh, seen many positive changes in uh, and some progress in areas related to women participation, we need to work on other areas. Challenger, challenges are still there, economic challenges, social challenges, culture and religion challenges, gender imbalance. There is inequality and social injustice, but chances of equal opportunity for, men, for women are becoming available nowadays. There is a political will from the main political parties, the KDP, PUK and Goran leadership in the region to empower women. There is also will from the parliament and government to promote and support women, but this is not enough. <coughs> Uh, there are points that we have to discuss first. Political parties need to be more serious in promoting women for leadership roles where they have the capacity of making decisions. Second, government to empower more women to see more in decision-making positions. Third, the parliament implement law in favor of women and in favor of involving more women in the decision-making role. The fourth point is the media and civil society to promote such kind of approach. The fifth point is the importance of education and raising awareness through education, the children on gender equality. Because if we want a real change to make, to take places, we need to start with the youngest generation and teach girls and boys how to accept each other as equals. The seven is the society must provide equal opportunity for men and women by, by installing an appropriate legal environment and uh, encouraging gender equality in practice. And finally, the women themselves and women organizations have to uh, 
common gender to promote this. But more importantly, we need our participants in the international community to help support in this process. Uh, I would also like to thank the Baroness uh, for giving her, sending her uh, the message and congratulate us. Uh, my message here for Her uh, Excellency. I hope she will take it to consideration. But uh, as I said, the more important we need our participants in the international community to help support this process. For example, we need the UK Parliament to help the Kurdistan Regional Par Parliament as a whole, but also women in the UK Parliament to help women in Kurdistan so that to know their role, responsibility, their mission, and what they can do to help the promote, to promote this subject. If we talk about women in diplomacy and diplomatic field, we do not have any women in this field because it's a new subject to the region as a whole. And we do not have institutions that would help student and government officials to graduate in. We have university, but they are not enough to, in order to bring up diplomats. In Iraq, for example, there is a foreign service institute before recruiting anyone at the Iraqi foreign ministry, they interview people and they will have them to be there for one year courses for junior diplomat who newly joined to be a diplomat and a six month courses for ambassadors who will act as an ambassador for Iraq. But in Kurdistan region, we do not have this. Therefore, the UK institution, the diplomatic academic, the European Union, and even the Western countries can help Kurdistan in order to promote and support women who want to work in the diplomatic field. We do not want any woman to be a leader just for the sake of being a woman. We want women who are capable, who have characteristic of a leader and who will be able to defend the region and make decision, which will benefit the region and the population as a whole. And for that capacity, we need the international community support so that we can train them and prepare them for a diplomatic or a diplomatic mission. We need to have more engagement with the region to provide more opportunity for women in Kurdistan to engage at conferences and also to participate in the government delegations. For example, any capacity building program for human resources development program or given to KRG, whether to the government or the parliament or, the, or the, to the political party, it must have a condition that the candidate will have at least half of them to be a woman, to be a woman so that the woman could be able to be empowered and to have a say. Yes, I mentioned earlier, Kurdistan region has done a lot to improve the status of women, to provide equal opportunity to empower them, but we are not there. We have made some progress, for example, 20 years ago, we would not have been we would not have seen women in the field of security and police but thanks to the to the courage of the women themselves the support of their families and the approach of the government to reach to what we have today and we have to thank the un security council resolution 1325 for women peace and security that we have more women in the police forces and the peshmerga forces as a whole but we still need women voices to have influence on the agenda of human security and, and peace. Women can play a role. They can contribute and participate in the sector. When they give opportunity, it's important to make sure that networking is available, capacity building programs are available, exchange programs and informations are available. Even inviting people from Kurdistan to the UK or other country is costly and impossible, but it's it's possible to send trainers to Kurdistan or take small number of women who have the potential and want to be diplomats to train them and they can train the other peers when they back. There are means and ways in address. Definitely for this way, we, we, we need to evaluate the current status of women in Kurdistan to see where women are today, where do they stand, where they, what they have achieved and what they have not able to achieve, what are the obstacles, what are the challenges, how can we address these challenges and solve them, are they social, are they culture, are they governmental, traditional or legislative, we need to address issues, where are the government and the parliament stands for these issues, 
Do not forget that we are living in Kurdistan, which is part of Iraq. In Iraq, we see the rise and the control of the Islamic parties, which means political Islamic is in raising. Looking at the neighborhood, Turkey, Iran, Syria, where Islamic parties are in raising. Considering the environment where we live, in this background, we need to address these issues in such way that we can attract more support, but in a, nas in a national way, so that our women can play a positive role in solving these problems. We need to categorize them. How can we address the social pro problem? How can we address the economical problems? When we, when we need women to be in control and in power, we need them to be socially and economically independent. When women in leadership of political, political party have a say in the decision, it means that they have been truly in power. When a woman sits in the cabinet level and they can discuss and put forward the demand of, of women, this means that they have been in power. In parliament also, we need that there are women who have engaged in addressing women issues, means that women on, are on the right path. We have the political will. Oh, the society is ready and women are ready themselves, but we have not achieved that considering the pandemic, the economic challenges, the fight against ISIS, political differences between Erbil and Baghdad, and et cetera, are all, are all challenges. Especially this year, the theme has chosen to be challenged and also focus on gender equality. So I can say that challenges are huge, but opportunities are also huge. And thank you. Thank you very much, Siam Khan. Uh, you have discussed a lot of uh, opportunities and challenges, and we'll come back to you during the discussion. Uh, now, I would like to move to the next speaker who is joining us from Kurdistan, Tanya Khailani. Um, she's a former member of the Iraqi parliament and a co-founder of the Seed Foundation, an organization that works with survivors of violence and trafficking in Iraq. Uh, Tanya Khan was one of the key parliamentarians who legislated the 25% uh, quota for women in Iraqi Provisional Council. As an expert on political participation and peace building, she will be speaking about women in armed conflict and post conflict situation, and she will be covering the stories of Yazidi female survivors. Uh, Tanya Khan, please welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Hawar Khan, uh, Kat Karwan, and everybody on the panel and everybody who's watching today. It truly is an honor to be on this panel and to discuss such an important um, subject, uh, especially uh, having people from all around the world listening to us and listening to what Kurdish women have accomplished and what we still can accomplish. Uh, and thank you for that lovely introduction. Uh, so as Hawar Khan said, I... Um, uh, speaking about my own experience and how I view the progress of women and where we were and where we have gotten to. Definitely, there's a lot that has happened in the last few years, as, as Siam Khan had mentioned. But one of the important things that we have to look at is that, you know, we talk about women's empowerment, we talk about women playing a leading role, we talk about women in the decision-making process, but yet that is a very small number. That is very few women that can play that role. However, if we look at society as a whole, and if we look at what role women can play and where they actually sit in society, I think this is where we have to think about it. Now, um, I am a, a, a former politician and I decided not to continue with politics and I started uh, and I co-founded Seed Foundation, an organization I founded with my uh, a dear friend, Sherry Kram Talabani. And we wanted to ensure that women are on the forefront of, of the different sectors. So it's not just about ensuring that women are involved in politics or they're involved in or, or involved in business, but also in these different sectors. So when we founded SEED as a uh, development organization, we really wanted to ensure that women can, and actually all individuals in, in the Kurdistan region can have the right opportunities to ensure that they can be contributing to members of society and they can find their place, whether it is at the, you know, at the helm of the government or if it's, you know, as a teacher or as a mother at home. So to ensure that all these, um, that these different spheres have been covered. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about 
the, the our organization and what we do. And since most of our clients are actually from within the ZD community, um, one of the, the the main or the main focus that we work on is we provide case management, uh, we provide um, mental health support, we provide legal services, and we we provide different domain, uh, we provide different services to, to the survivors of violence. But um, our organization was founded in 2014 and we are a woman-led organization. So all of you know the, the, the top management of the organization are all women. And we believe we are a local NGO, but we believe in applying international best standards, but mixing it with the local know-how to ensure that there is acceptance to, to the concept and to the way we do things. So our vision really is to ensure that we have a prosperous Kurdistan with that, that provides equal opportunities for all. Um, and the way we, and the protection of rights for all different commun communities and minorities. And the way we wanna do this is that we wanted to focus on social educational economic development. And also we work with marginalized groups and we work with vulnerable groups and uh, to ensure that they are um, uh, th that they are protected and they are contributing members of society. So in order for us to have positive impact, we work in different domains. And the way we do the work is that we promote gender equality and we counter um, gender-based violence um, through whether it's through providing services or through providing training um, and education um, and training to, to partners, whether they're in government or other NGOs. And also we work on strengthening child protection from ever evolving protection threats. Uh, we work on improving mental health and psychosocial well-being. We also work on combating trafficking in persons and human trafficking in general. Our approach in our organization is that we work on, um, uh, we provide case management and we provide comprehensive care and service delivery to, to all of our clients. We work through education and training and supervision programs to strengthen the capacity of the uh, uh, service providers within the KRI. So like I said, whether they're in the government institutions, whether in the educational institutions or working with other NGOs. And also we work on advocacy and providing technical assistance to perform uh, to promote transformative changes and laws, policies, regulations, institutional practices, as well as social norms, beliefs, attitudes, and behaviors. And we also believe in operational excellence. That's something that we uh, very much apply to our work. And uh, a lot of NGOs, we hope, will do the same. The, the idea here is that we believe in capacity building and treat, uh, training for our staff to ensure that a lot of the, the the, the young women specifically that are working with us, they have a better opportunities. And as Siham Khan was saying, it's not enough to put a woman in a place, you have to ensure that she has the right training and she has the right ability, uh, she has the right tools to be able to perform in her position. If we talk about uh, women in armed conflict and in post-conflict situations. So why we founded SEED, one of the reasons we did this was, um, when we started talking about finding, uh, founding this organization, we really wanted to ensure that we can have a lasting impact. And Iraq, the Kurdistan region, has been through, through so many different um, conflicts and we will continue to go through conflict, unfortunately. This is something that is a reality in this region. But then how do we recover post-conflict? I think that is something that a lot of, um, uh, a lot of entities kind of tend to overlook. And if we look at, at something as simple as the, the, you know, the generational trauma that the, the different generation of women have actually gone through and individuals in general in the Kurdistan region have gone through, it is something that was, um, that we have not been able to break from. So when ISIS came and they took over, you know, one third of Iraq's uh, land, and then they, you know, unfortunately they, they enslaved our sisters and they um, and and they really treated the women quite badly. It was important that we actually were able to tackle how we can help these the, the, these individuals to cope. We do, and to be able to to deal with the trauma that they have went through. So when we founded Seed Organization, we wanted to ensure that we are contributing not just to the humanitarian but also to the medium and the long term impact that 
the 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 mental health of these survivors will have on the on the region as a whole. Um, also, one of the the one of the good news I think that I can deliver here today is that, as some of you may be aware, or most of you would be aware, in on March first, the uh, Yazidi survive the Yazidi female survivor bill was actually um, voted on in Parliament, but today it was actually signed into law, so it is official. It was signed by the president. This is the first time ever that a law like this recognizes the need to. Um, bring justice back to the women, to the women specifically in, in Iraq. So, and they actually renamed the law into the, the I think the Yazidi Turkmen and Shebek um, survivors law. So, which is definitely the first time ever that something like this has happened in Iraq. This definitely is a, um, a milestone. This is the first time something like this happens where Women in particular are told that we recognize you as victims, we recognize you as, as survivors, and we wanna ensure that you have the, pro the rights um, so you can actually um, uh, re rejoin the society or rejoin the community. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about some of the work that we do um, in terms of the, the survivors that the, or the cases that we have um, serviced in the last year. As you all know, COVID was quite difficult on many, on, on many um, individuals, on everybody actually worldwide. And Kurdistan was no different. Um, and unfortunately, women were the ones that uh, were affected the most according to many reports, international reports and studies, etc. And, you know, this is another battle that they that women had to face, whether it was in their workplace or whether at home, um, you know, they, the, the number of violence or domestic violence actually went up. So these are all things that were um, quite challenging, but we were still able to continue to service our um, clients. So we actually were able to service 570 clients last year, and we tried to get creative. Um, and when providing these services. And I really have to be thankful to our team uh, because they really did try different ways. They tried different methodologies in order to be able to reach out to, to our clients who are mostly ZD women to ensure that they continue with their, um, uh, with, their uh, with the support that they're getting with regards to mental health, with regards to the case management and also following up on their legal cases. So that is something that we are very proud of to say that, you know, despite all the obstacles, we were able to still continue to, to provide services. One of the other points that I would like to um, point out here is that, you know, working in the NGO sector or working in the, in the um, non-governmental sector, you know, a lot of people look at it as a, as, as a soft, power, I can even say, you know, or they don't see it as, as, as important. So we actually find that a lot of women tend to find their, this is where they're finding their place is in the NGO sector, or the non-governmental organizations. So you'll find a lot of organizations They will have, you know, women will kind of go and work there. They have founded these organizations, they work in these organizations and so on. But one of the things that they, um, that, uh, the, the, I think that in general, the people in Kurdistan, they in the beginning, they really didn't think of it as, as, as something that can be very influential. But really, the, you know, the way we look at it is the way I look at it is that when you're talking about the, the NGOs or working in that humanitarian or that development sector, really, you're kind of in the middle of, of it all. You know, you have the politics and then or you have the top down approach where, you know, a lot of political parties maybe were looking at or a lot of other um, government entities, et cetera, they'd be looking down. And then you have the, the, you know, the bottom up approach. But I find that the NGOs really tend to be in the middle because they tend to be able to influence both sides of the spectrum, you know, so whether they're working with the, with the top leaderships, whether they're advocating, whether they are lobbying the, the politicians to ensure that we have uh, proper legislation and procedures in place in order to guarantee people's rights um, and to ensure that um, you know those at risk of violence actually are being protected, but also at the same time, raising awareness within the population to ensure that people, um, um, uh, they know where to go for help, for example, they know how to, um, um, you know, how to, I guess, go to court, where they need to go and these kinds of things. So I think that there is a lot of things that can be done. And again, if we go back to, um, you know, in a, in a post-conflict 
environment, there is always a need to, to look at the, the medium term and the long term impact of anything that is being done and not just focusing on the on the on the immediate impact of, of these conflicts because you know no matter what happens and you know none of us are um I think even as individual Kurdistanis, we all are traumatized. We all have, whether we ourselves were actually exposed to violence or somebody we know. So there's a lot of, you know, secondary and tertiary trauma. And because we have not dealt with these, with, uh, with, with these conflicts in the past in a way to, in order for us to be able to kind of overcome or to, to be able to cope with these traumas, I think it's become a generational, um, a generational re-traumatization that we are seeing. So, you know, right now in the month of March when we have all these celebrations um, of, of the, the, the Raparin and, and the, the revolutions that happened and things like that, but at the same time, we never, really stop to think okay what about what happened next it's great we're celebrating all these days and we are we're commemorating them but then it's more than just you know having these these tv documentaries it's more than just you know putting out a monument there has to be something that truly really helps the individuals to be able to overcome and to be able to to kind of um uh, i don't want to say move on but really you know because nobody when when you have been traumatized you, you don't really just kind of uh, you don't become better it's about coping and uh, and this is one of the things that it's it's fairly new in Kurdistan that we are recognizing these uh, th these uh, um, these coping or the need for coping or the need for for medium um, and long-term solutions for our problems and not just the immediate. And definitely the Yazidi survivor bill, I think uh, was very, a very positive note because um, that truly really recognized women as survivors and, and, and tried to meet their needs. And here I must say also uh, the fact that it was the Kurdistani list and they were unified in terms of First of all, even putting this law forward, you know, with the with the um, the backing of the president of Iraq, um, you know, that this law was actually put on the schedule. This was this law was voted on, and then the role that the women's committee, especially the Kurdistani members of the women's committee, played in order to ensure that this law gets passed. And it does not take away from 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 the, the, the soul of, of the law and kind of ensuring that it still does recognize the genocide that happened to the Yazidis and recognizing the Yazidi survivors and what services that are required of, for them. I think that is very important. And I am very proud to say that, you know, it was the, the, the people of Kurdistan that did this and, you know, um, and they will, and we will continue to support the survivors of violence and the survivors of war to ensure that you know these things do not happen again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tanya Khan, for sharing your um, expertise and um, experience and the activities of um, SEED with us. We would like to elaborate more on the points you raised uh, later on in the discussion. Um, thank you again. Um, now I would like to uh, move to the uh, other speaker, Dr. Sama Almani. Um, she's an academic and author. She has been playing a very influential role in many fields, including politics, philosophy, human rights, and gender equality. Um, she was a Peshmerga, and um, she has introduced various initiative courses and publication on gender. She has been focusing on philosophy of mind, knowledge, science, and language. On this important day, she has published her new book, book on women and philosophy, philosophy of gender throughout Kurdistan. Um, in this webinar, she'll be talking about gender equality and women empowerment, how the Kurdish women could have greater voice and choice to participate fully and equally in all aspects of political, economic, and social life. And uh, Dr. Sama, please welcome. Sorry, Dr. Sama, you're muted. Um, we can't hear you. Thank you. My apology. I hope you can hear me now. Can you hear me now? Yes, yeah, you can hear you. Thank you. I said greetings to everyone, and I thank you very much for inviting me on this day. 
um, 8th of March, uh, Women Day, um, to uh, give you what I think is needed in, uh, in Kurdistan also um, to talk and to listen um, to other contributors, which I, I really value and appreciate. And I'm glad I heard uh, what I heard today so far. <laughs> Um, yes, the title is um, to have to talk about gender equality in all sections, if I sum it up. Um, but I am going to take you to a new area, uh, which has been neglected so far uh, for one reason, which is um, basically, if you work in university, if you produce theories, then you should be fine, you should be covered, you should be supported. Um, and there is no gender issue, especially I work in philosophy and um, everyone who works in philosophy or in sciences, um, they know that is, um, uh, it is very difficult to tackle any gender equality um, because um, we are, uh, philosophy is counted as uh, gender neutral. There is no um, prejudice um, uh, is highly valued, and, and so is sciences. Um, now we, uh, I mean, if, if, if there are um, people who can hear me and they are from Britain and um, European uh, countries, we have tackled that um, for decades now, and uh, we have established um, quite good um, outcome. Still need um, a lot to be done in relation to this. Uh, but today I'm, I'm talking about um, the, uh, what is needed in Kurdistan and my book today is, a, is, uh, is going to be published, actually has been published because of the um, time differences between uh, England and Kurdistan. Um, and it is all about that. So what is it about? I'm not going to give you the entire detail of my arguments, uh, which is a few arguments I have produced um, uh, all together because uh, otherwise <laughs> there is no point for people to read it. But I'm going to take you through a few points, uh, which is, um, I think is very important for participants uh, to hear it and also for people who are listening and hope, hopefully from uh, people from the universities and from the government as well um, as I have produced um, some um, solution to these problems as well. Um, so we work, we are academics, uh, we have quite uh, plenty of um, uh, universities. In fact, we have 33 universities in the Kurdish region of Iraq, which is very good um, uh, number and they do a um, variety of subject and um, uh, two of them do philosophy, actually three of them now do in philosophy and have uh, philosophy departments. But do we have many women um, doing philosophy? Um, well, just like every other country, at the BA level, we have plenty of students. Um, in fact, I was teaching there uh, for two years and a half sort of uh, time. Um, majority of um, BA class were women. But do you see them when they come to master degrees? Um, the number will drop. In a, hugely. And then uh, do you see them when they do, when it comes to PhD, it will drop again. Do you see them when they, they get employed by the university, the number will get dropped again. And do you see them uh, fulfilling their potential to become professors, to produce um, arguments, theories, to challenge, to write? Um, uh, that's almost as non-existence. Okay, so we have a problem. And I thought about that either, um, you know, I have to just criticize and challenge or just um, have uh, introduce um, a section in philosophy from now on to take care of all of that, which I call um, philosophy of gender. In philosophy of gender, we have the environment, which is universities, and also we have the attached environment to the academic environment, which is intellectual hopes um, uh, and um, uh, hubs rather, and uh, centers and publication houses, uh, um, uh, all the, uh, the culture um, uh, centers, 
um, and, and universities. What I, I mean, I, I have to, I have to say, um, we have thirty-three gender centers in inside of uh, uh, universities, which is mean, uh, if you calculate thirty-three universities and thirty-three gender centers, it means every university have one gender center, but they haven't started their work yet. It has been established. Um, they have um, every gender center have one manager but no staff and no material to teach and no, nobody there to teach any gender um, uh, courses. So we need to, to tackle that. We need to uh, start that, um, but their job is limited. We still need some law, some uh, to make um, the uh, university environment gender friendly, all of them regardless of what they study, um, and also to have these gender uh, centers to start doing their jobs. One of the, uh, one of the area I have experienced um, uh, is problematic is none of these environment that I have mentioned, including the universities, uh, understand gender issue. The staff, the management, the leaders, they need to be trained. They need to um, open their eyes and see what is gender issue? What sort of problem? What is a prejudice? How to perform? How we perform uh, a better environment? And to identify what is uh, these gender prejudice, prejudice is uh, affect and how they affect and how to eliminate them. Now, we can do that by law, by introducing law. Is, there is, uh, uh, we can do that as we heard today um, that uh, we have produced a law, new law in regarding of the AZ, these women, which is very good. I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, delighted to hear that. I know that. I, kn I knew about it, but I didn't know they will sign it today. Um, and uh, we have to introduce gender law that to be implemented in all area in the society, universities or otherwise. And that uh, is one of the, um, one of the solution um, that I have proposed at the end of it, um, to really to work on that with the universities and with the government, um, how to produce that law. I uh, obviously I, I produce a few um, arguments that I'm not going to talk about um, today, but there is one um, I, I may talk about uh, one argument there, which is how um, the uh, environment, um, uh, where is it, there is a prejudice against women, um, can um, contribute into philosophy itself. Because um, it will produce one-sided imbalanced philosophy um, and uh, also to eliminate women um, from getting their potential and getting uh, leading um, the departments, the universities, a project, a philosophical project and identifying and designing uh, topics for uh, uh, investigation, philosophy investigation, uh, then um, that will affect philosophy itself. What sort of philosophy do we produce? Now, philosophy is a new uh, area uh, in Kurdistan. Um, uh, it has been there for quite some time, but still is a, is a new ground and we can um, uh, have an input in, in, in that ground and um, balance it, balance it well. So that book is all about that. Um, and uh, obviously, I don't know, I'm, I'm aware because I've been, I've been threatened not to talk much about the book <laughs> as um, they want to sell it and it's uh, not for me, but for them. Uh, and they want to um, make um, uh, people aware of, of some social prejudice and uh, gender prejudice. Obviously, when we talk about prejudice, they are all will have similarity. Um, so what I have um, produced in that book, it can be used for other, other type of prejudice and uh, as a, a other 
um, constraint on other groups that suffer from prejudice and they're eliminated from producing theories and from raising voice in academic level. So I'm going to leave it at that. And um, thank you very much again for um, inviting me here. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sama. And we would like to congratulate you on your publication and we look forward to reading it. Uh, we would like to ask you more questions later on uh, on the book uh, in the discussion. Thank you very much. And now I would like to move to the next speaker, uh, Dr. Fania Ismail, um, who is recognized as one of the most innovative women in the UK, as she was announced a winner of Women in Innovation Award in 2019 by Innovative UK for inventing a paper coating technology to replace plastic liner in coffee cups. Um, her innovative technology also gained her the top prize diamond award at Math Challenge Switzerland 2020. Uh, she was the first female to pick up the diamond prize. Um, she is the CEO and founder of Sigma, a company focusing on the development of social technology delivering solution to global challenges. In this webinar, Dr. Fania will share her expertise and also talk about the role of women in business um, and how to maximize women's contribution to the economy. Dr. Fania, please welcome. Yeah, do you hear me? Yeah, thank you so much, Lega Khan. Thank you so much, Kak uh, Karwan, for the uh, kind introduction. Thank you so much for the uh, speakers and the um, uh, kind insight uh, into the role of the women. So I'd like to take the opportunity today to congratulate them and congratulate all the women in every single corner of the world uh, on the International Women's Day. The roles that they play and they're still playing, uh, the achievements that they have achieved, and there's still a lot plenty to achieve. Uh, it's a day to celebrate, but also remember to relax as well. I'm trying to remember myself as well. <laughs> so let me tell you a bit about myself and my journey here in the UK. Um, uh, maybe that will help somebody um, out there listening to us today. Uh, so um, I'm Fanny Ismail. I'm the CEO and founder of SGMA. Um, I am, um, I don't know, do you hear me, Lady Khan? I am, yeah? Yes, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, so I am, um, um, I'm a mother of um, three, so I'm an ordinary woman. Uh, I have three beautiful children. Um, I moved to the UK uh, mid-1990s. Uh, when I arrived to the UK, I wasn't able to say two words properly in English. I was scared to go on the bus on my own. Uh, and uh, yeah, I've faced so many challenges so far. Being a um, Kurdish female Muslim woman in the UK, it's not an uh, easy thing. I was in, not only didn't know the language, but I also do, didn't know the system as well. So I've, uh, you know, it has been a journey since. Uh, but uh, you know, I've um, I've turned 50 <laughs> this year. So when I was younger, I was full of energy uh, and thinking, actually, I can change the world. You know, I was like so many things that I'm not happy about. I want to change. But, you know, as you become more mature, you realize uh, all what you need is to change yourself. Um, and that would be the starting point. So after entering my 40s, I started to read a lot about, so I can understand myself, what is it that I need to do for the rest of my life? And I came across the book of Paul McKenna at the time, and one question that he put across to know yourself a bit better was, uh, what is it if you do for the rest of your life, it will make you happy? And trust me, it took me six months to figure out what is it that it will make me happy for the rest of my life because well, you know when you are asked this question you'd immediately thinking of my like uh, you know money children marriage you know uh, love all the things that you you know things that will we thinking about on a daily basis but if you're thinking of, of a lifetime aim that you want to have be happy on a single day basis that when you wake up in the morning what would that be and after thinking so hard i realized actually what makes me happy is when I'm able to put a smile on other people's face. But then I'm thinking, okay, who am I to be able to put smiles on other people's face? Do you know, I'm just an ordinary person. So I started to list off my strengths. What are my strengths? 
and what is it that makes me, you know, what, what makes it unique to me as a person. So I've realized that the knowledge I had, which I gained during my PhD at the University of Manchester, because I won a scholarship from Royal Society of Chemistry in the UK in 2000 to do my PhD there. I focused on a, a technology called saw job technology, which is basically making glass-like materials at room temperature. So I've realized the knowledge that I had at the time, it will take the industry another 10, 15 years to develop the same understanding. So for me, it was the point of, okay, how am I going to use that unique selling point that I have? So I started to um, uh, mapping the global landscape. I spent 12 months to study the global industry, who's doing what, where the gaps are in the market. I've generated my own directory, and I've started to dig deep into where the market opportunity is. And I, after the 12 months, I've started networking. So the networking sessions I've started to attend that relates to my field. So I've started locally, of course, first. Uh, and we have a local innovation center where I started to network there. And I came across a organization called uh, Enterprise Europe Network, which they come under the Innovate UK umbrella. So they helped me uh, with uh, studying my idea a bit more and uh, and they also helped me with making a grant application to Innovate UK in 2014. And I got a 5,000 pounds as a grant at the time, which I used to hire the facility at a, a local university. And I, uh, um, and I started to test my ideas because I designed my products just using a pen and paper on my kitchen table. So I had no idea whether it's going to work or not. So it was a very, very high risk. But that small grant helped me to test my idea and I made my first prototype in 2015. And then when the first prototype was ready and it was working very nicely, there was plenty of other challenges, of course. I mean, the main thing I focused at the time when I made my prototype was to make sure that there is a commercial case out of it. You can actually make a product to the market and make profit out of it. There was, this is crucial to make it to go out from an ordinary research. So I had that point in hand, and then I started 2015 until 2017, two years exactly, um, as a single female founder, having the surname of Ismail, it wasn't easy to set up a chemical company. <laughs> so the challenges were so, so difficult because um, I had to get a license in place to set up my own company, and also the insurance in place, it took probably I think it was about 10 or 11 months before we managed to get the insurance because I wasn't affiliated with any big organizations or university. I was just me, myself and I trying to set up a chemical company. So um, engaging with the local council and the people uh, from, you know, the uh, government agencies in the UK from London, I started to get the help that I need and managed to find a place and with help of my family, uh, in 2017, I had the key to my own premises, uh, completely independent, and SGMA was set up with a mission to make a toxic-free world, products that are really people and, and planet-friendly. So from 2017 until 2019, we started to, okay, coating is applicable to many industries. Which industry are we going to focus on? And, you know, it would be more attractive to ourselves, our investors, and so I can engage properly with the industries. And we had to optimize the product because we just had the first prototype. We had to optimize it, develop it further for a particular industry and replacing plastic by more sustainable um, uh, product, sustainable material was the outstanding one. The, the market worth $400 billion a year, it's incredibly massive. And you know, for us, for our product to work in that sector, it was incredibly mind blowing. So we started to develop the product uh, uh, a bit further. So we improved on the prototype and we started to engage with the investors uh, and also with the uh, IP attorneys so we can protect our technology because you have a technology, how do you protect it in the, in the global market. It's just uh, it's something that I never came across. I didn't any, know anybody within our community that can help me and direct me within all the challenges I'm facing. 
So um, uh, with the help of some, uh, you know, uh, key people uh, from London, they helped me to figure out my IP and they opened my eyes more about how can I actually protect my IP. So we started to work on patents. So we had a um, top city firm in London law firm to work and protect on our IP. And in 2019, I was um, announced as one of the uh, women innovation winner in the UK. Uh, so that was uh, really a cool thing because out of uh, sudden I found myself to be treated like a celebrity, which I was like, uh, I'm only working from a garage, you know, <laughs> garage size premise is not very fancy um, place at the moment. So we kind of, uh, when the announcement went out uh, within days, um, the level of the exposure was incredible. We had top brands that we, you know, like picking up the phone, uh, dropping as a line saying, oh, we would like to talk to you, congratulations, we need to know more about your technology. So the level of engagement was just like mind blowing. It's like, I never thought that we can do this. And we also got 50,000 uh, pounds as a fund so we can improve our technology further. So since 2019 until now, we have been working on scaling up our technology, closing, you know, working very closely with our industry partners in Europe and America. Uh, last uh, summer, uh, about um, three, four months ago, we have raised half a million pounds on Angels Den Investment Online Platform for our technology uh, uh, to scale up. Uh, and we have, I was, yeah, I only, uh, also won the... Um, Mass Challenge, uh, Diamond Prize, the first female to win such a uh, prize, uh, and also came with 125,000 pounds for our company, so to help us to uh, further um, finishing the development. Uh, and at the moment, as we stand today, we remain the only technology, to the best of our knowledge, of course, we remain the only technology in the world that we have a technology that's 100% plastic and microplastic free, that is capable to solve the um, uh, packaging problem, problem in, in the world. Uh, we currently have uh, seven patents filed and my company is valued at seven million pounds. Um, and we are continuing the development of scale up process with a vision that that we'd be able to one day put the smile on your face, guys, and also to be able to put a coffee cup in your hand that's plastic uh, and microplastic free uh, and where it's guilt free. So you don't feel the guilt when you drink from that cup. Um, so that's 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 my journey have been so far. Uh, and it would be, an, um, you know, uh, nice if I can just make a point here on this uh, particular day, since we are all about women. Um, it'd be nice if I can see more women involved, Kurdish women involved in the sector. When I go networking, I see them, it, you know, to know more about their idea, to see if I can help with it anyway, because I have been through a hell of <laughs> amount of challenges for, for a number of years until we here. Yeah. Uh, so it'd be nice to see them so they come out. There's a lot of help and support available, by the way. Being in the UK gives you that advantage of having access to multiple platforms. Uh, the UK government started in the last five years to pay a lot of attention in the role of women in business and uh, innovation because after they have done a research, they found out that actually by encouraging more women to get involved in business and innovation, that will open a door of about... Uh, 1.8 billion uh, uh, pounds a year uh, to improve the UK economy. So it would be good. I'm sure that we have so many talented women here in the UK and not also in the UK, actually, even in Kurdistan, because there's so many programs that there are open for international women. If you have a groundbreaking idea, if you have a, a, a something that you are working on and thinking of, unless you try, you wouldn't know. And um, you know, if just reach out and, and make yourself more visible, it would be nice to, to hear from them. So yeah, I'll, I'll hand over back to you, Lega. So um, thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, thank you very much, uh, Fania Khan. Uh, I'll get back to you to ask you for more tips on how women can uh, develop their business ideas. Uh, thank you again. Now I would like uh, to ask our next speaker, um, would be the last speaker, uh, Roida Mustafa. She is a British uh, Kurdish doctoral candidate at Kingston University, London. She writes on social political affairs concerning the Kurdistan region, and she's an 
advocate for greater rights for those with developmental disabilities. She is a founder of um, Kurdish Policy Board, a grassroots movement that aims to increase British Kurdish engagement, integration, and political representation across the Kurdistan, uh, across the United Kingdom. In this webinar, she will be talking about diaspora and transnationality. How can the female diaspora contribute to the national and international developments? Uh, Roy Dahan, please welcome. Thank you for inviting me today. I'm very happy to be with you all, uh, particularly given that it's International Women's Day. I love Dr. Fania's energy. I was, you know, had a really long day and then just hearing how positive and energetic you are, I loved it. Um, and I love that you want to help other women uh, follow your footsteps. I think women in diaspora, we can play a very good role, a, a prominent role in empowering women within Kurdistan region. But at the same time, we have limitations. One of the limitations I have found personally is that you know, we, we are raised in, for example, I'm, I was raised in England. I was raised with a set of values, with a different experience. And then you go to Kurdistan, you somehow assume that in more ways than one, that women could also have those opportunities if they just try hard enough. But the truth is there are multiple layers of barriers that they face. Um, so in terms of how we, the women in diaspora can contribute towards female empowerment and development, I would say the most important thing is to find a mechanism where we can talk. And this is where I've not found any platforms that brings together women in Kurdistan, in Europe, in America and other countries where we can discuss an agenda for women's empowerment and progress outside of the narrative as victims or as uh, victims of domestic violence, of, of human trafficking, but actually, you know, discussing things like what can we learn about uh, the plight of women in UK in regards to childcare? What can we do more for Kurdish women to have access to greater political representation in places like Iraq, where you either need to be on a quota or you need to support a political party to actually get somewhere? Um, but to kind of highlight what I am doing at the moment, I am working uh, with Kurdish people across the United Kingdom to increase our political representation and to make them more active locally because for years and years we've been one leg in Kurdistan, one leg in UK and I want us to actually find a way where we can reach our utmost potential in the United Kingdom and then take that uh, where at the same time we're promoting the best of British expertise and promoting um, uh, something within Kurdistan region. Um, I, I wanted to highlight some someone called Mivan Baba Bekir, and she's doing something called um, she's the CEO of Full Fact, and she's a British uh, Kurdish woman, and she's working on she's established a project where she's pairing up um, people in Syria, in Iraq, in Turkey, and Iran uh, with technology savvy individuals within the UK. So that's one way uh, where, you know, you could kind of see the actual product of UK expertise taking the lead. And she is taking young people or of all ages who are into um, software development who actually need a guide. So I know Dr. Fania said that, you know, she, when she started out, she didn't have a system of support. So the, this is what Mivan is doing. She's trying to kind of give back to uh, young Kurds and in fact, anyone within those countries that are conflict ridden, an opportunity to escape that cycle. Um, <clears throat> personally, one of the projects, <clears throat> excuse me, I recently was involved in was to promote British expertise um, in the field of autism. And that's where we try to provide teachers and um, families with workshops so that they know how to deal and raise a child with a developmental disorder. So there's a ton of things we can do uh, from the diaspora, but we, we just lack, I know it sounds confusing, but we lack direction. You know, where are we going with all of these things we're doing? We've got dozens of individuals who are doing tiny little things throughout Kurdistan region, but we don't have, you know, a, a, a sort of um, 
that end goal, you know, and we don't have a, a, a sort of platform where we can bring everyone together and actually have an agenda that would make all our efforts more meaningful and actually more uh, connected. Um, in addition to that, I wanted to highlight something else uh, on building for the future generation. So when I was 10 years ago, when I was 18 years old, uh, it was really hard. No, actually 10 years ago, I was 20. I've just forgotten, I'm in my 30s now. Um, so 10 years ago, it was very difficult for a young Kurdish girl, grown women, growing up in England. I had no support system. I had no idea on, you know, which political party I wanted to support here, what university I wanted to go, what I wanted to study. So now we want to change all of that. We actually want to be as robust as the British Indian community or the British Sikh community or the British Jewish community. We want our communities across the country to come together, to work together, to increase um, our political representation, actually work, do work in a way where, you know, we're fully integrated in UK and giving back to the Kurdistan region. And a while ago, we talked about how if you're a diaspora, there's, if it's not a burden, but there's this expectation that we have to give back to Kurdistan, but we are also fully part of the countries that we're in. You know, I am 100% British as much as I'm 100% Kurdish. So it would it would be unfair to kind of have an expectation where Kurds in Europe or in, we in Western countries only contribute back to Kurdistan, only, you know, take the best of what we learn and have here and go back to Kurdistan. But we also want to fully integrate uh, where li we live. So I don't have much more to say other than um, the future is definitely bright. It's, it's, it's not all, um, it's not all gloom and hopefully in the years to come, we're going to work much better together, not just as women, but across the platform with men as well. And I really hope the takeaway from this event would be to have a platform where um, we can discuss a national agenda for women and the members of parliament within the United Kingdom would be more than happy to support any Iraqi, Kurdish or other community efforts in empowering women. It's just a question of connecting both sides and bringing both sides together. And I don't have much more to add. Uh, I love listening to all of you. I, I find that you are all a bit older than me and I'm very humbled and honored to be in the presence of everyone. So thank you. Thank you very much, Roy Dakhan. Um, you have uh, shared with us the project of uh, Miva Khan. We did extend her um, an invitation to participate uh, today and share her experience with us, but uh, maybe she has been busy and she was not able to join. We hope to host her in other events in the upcoming future. And uh, now I would like to, uh, we have a very limited timing um, left, so uh, I would like to move to the question and answers. We have received um, a few questions uh, directed uh, to each speakers. And um, I'll start by directing the first one to Tanya Khan uh, with regards to the contribution of women in peace building. How can we encourage women to get more involved in conflict resolution and peacemaking? Wow, I think that's a, that's a PhD dissertation right there. Uh, maybe Dr. Samal can help us with that. Um, I, the important thing really is when we're talking about the contribution of women in peace building is to ensure that you always have a voice or you believe that your voice is always heard. I think that's what's important because when we're talking about peace building, it's not just about the negotiators that sit at the table, you know, and, and I have been involved in many efforts, you know, bringing different women from different political parties and from different entities to ensure that you know our voices are heard and our demands as women and what matters to us as women is important because you know when you have at the negotiations table the men are sitting there they're talking about how many weapons you know what territory and whatnot but for us it's about how safe it is for my children to go to school how can i ensure that they can come back without being harmed how can i ensure my elderly, you know, parents can go to the hospital and get the services that they need. So the, the priorities are different. So in order to ensure that women really can be part of this process is that, you know, just not to be quiet, you know, and whenever there is, when they, when they say that 
if there is a you know a door closes, you should always try a window. Continue to 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 speak up. And I think now with the rise of social media and you know what we call the the citizen uh, journalism and and the different methods by which uh, people can express themselves, it doesn't have to be like you know. I remember Wade said something that of us being from the older generation. I remember the days when we used to go on demonstrations and you know holding up signs. That's how we expressed our our disdain or that's how we expressed our um uh, you know our activism but now it's very different you can be sitting behind a computer screen and just as we're doing today in this meeting and you can be talking to so many different people so you know just to ensure that that if, if, no matter what they say no matter how they see you know the in terms of your opinion does, is not significant or your opinion does not matter or your voice is not loud enough. Uh, I think it's important for you to continue talking. And, uh, and I also wanna highlight what Thruida said in terms of having that collective voice, ensuring that you really are you know, getting buy-in from others. You're, you're getting people that, that believe in your cause and ensure, you know, and, and, they, and they all join you and it, you know, I, I think I'm going to end up uh, quoting Dr. Seuss there, but definitely, you know, everybody matters, no matter how big or small. And I think that that's what's important is to ensure that you continue speaking. Uh, thank you very much. I definitely agree with you. Um, I would like to uh, move to the next question uh, directed to Siam Khan. Uh, it says, what are the Karaji's top priority issues when it comes to advancing gender equality? Hello, Siam Khan, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, Hawar Khan. Thank you for the question. Uh, actually, uh, to be honest, when it comes to the KRG, KRG is a very new emerged region to this part of the Iraq. Uh, as I said, Kurdistan region has done a lot. Uh, the establishment of the uh, Women Council, which is uh, <clears throat> attached directly to the Prime Minister's office is a huge step for the KRG to have done in these steps. And as Dr. Samal said that we have 33 um, university and each university has its own gender equality center, but it has not been active and playing their role. It is the same with the minister, with the KRG uh, government ministerials uh, that they have established. It has become uh, an order from the uh, Council of Ministers to establish the gender equality. A center in all the universe, in all the ministry, yes, ministries and all the direct threats. Also, we have it. Uh, we have a committee that belongs to the gender equality program, but uh, we need uh, we need more to understand, as she said, what is what is gender equality. Uh, what uh, what is the steps that the government should take it. We have, uh, we have organizations, we have uh, um, UN um, uh, organizations also with different programs. They are engaging with the, with the country, but it's not only one issue that to focus on. Uh, it, it has been very broad uh, and uh, with, with, with different programs, definitely we are working on, uh, on that as a government, but we still need the international uh, engagement, the support, the support from the, uh, the <clears throat> uh, specialized women organizations to have uh, provide a different program for the government sectors, women's, and also the other, uh, it's not only the public sectors that the the, the, the other sectors is, is needed to have focus on these uh, topics. Uh, I believe that with the, with the coming um, plans that the KRG is having, uh, the program will, will, will uh, set up in a very good shape and women's, women should, could, could play a role in this because I believe that if if the woman has the ability and the power and the desire is there, women could reach to any point of the positions and the levels that they want. But it's in the hand of the women. 
we saw that the desire is very, very low for the woman to come. It has been always, and it has not been easy for the woman to take a different position, different professional position in the, in the KRG, in the diplomatic uh, mission, in the private sector. But uh, very recently, the economical situation has affected uh, the level of the society that uh, and also affected the desire of the woman to step forward and to receive different uh, approaches and to have different views uh, by themselves. I did a research. Uh, I did a research in two thousand twelve for my leadership action plan. Uh, I went to the universities and to just see how different between the boys and the girls for the graduation to see if there is a, a huge gap between boys and girls for the, the level of the graduation. I made a comparison between 2008 and 2012. In 2008, the graduation uh, amount of the boys were a uh, portion was 50, 52, uh, girls were 48. In 2012, it was exactly vice versa. In 2012, girls were 52 uh, and boys were 48. And I did the research and the reason behind of how these big gaps started for, uh, from the family, from the society, from the, the girls, the women themselves, it belongs to the, the, the level of the economic that we we saw from 2008 to 12 a huge gap of economical uh, progress started in KRG and it has affected even on the level of the education. So I believe that education is a key and the desire of the woman is a key. And if they are ready, the government and the political party and the institutions are also ready to step forward. Uh, thank you thank very you. much. I think advancing gender equality is one of the top priorities for the Kurdistan regional government. And, Absolutely. And uh, this has to be like, uh, uh, this needs a lot of efforts to tackle many challenges that women are facing. This would take me to a question uh, directed to Dr. Sama. Uh, could you elaborate more on your arguments and also to what extent do you think your recommendation would influence the decision-making process and the education system in Kurdistan? Um, let me see if it's not muted. Okay, it's not muted. You have to, um, uh, you will hear me. Um, my recommendation is, um, is, is plenty of recommendation in the book and, and, and also I can say, few things from hearing the contributors um, to this panel. Um, first of all, I'm glad to hear them. Uh, is, um, is all achievement, which is very good. But we have to um, acknowledge there are other side where um, the people are trying to achieve something in Kurdistan women, I mean, by people, uh, but, but um, they haven't um, accomplished anything. And uh, for many reasons, one of the reason is um, promoting members of political parties rather than members of public in general. This is one thing women can tackle that issue because we're supposed to be united. We're supposed to encourage other women, whether they are belong to our circle of group or not, to our politics or not. Um, and this is very important for us. Um, I, the, the first speaker, um, I, I do remember um, she mentioned um, that um, we need, um, we need agent, we need people, thinkers um, to do this job and that job in leadership, but we do have them. We do have them in, in Europe. Um, you can take them back. Um, they do not have to be belong to one a famous family or one uh, political uh, um, parties. They can be anyone, you can advertise for it. And I'm sure there will be plenty who would like to serve um, Kurdistan um, um, on, on every different level, on a leadership level, and they are fully equipped, fully trained um, in Europe, um, ready uh, to be uh, employed. Um, this is one, um, you know, one, one, one way to, to see things and to see it as a solution to the problem of non-existing 
um, uh, people who are trained to to do the um, leading to lead the uh, se sectors. Uh, what I have proposed um, in my in my book, um, I have discussed that um, obviously before uh, writing the book, is um, basically is awareness. Is awareness gender awareness is different. You can be a, a wonderful scientist. You can be a wonderful philosopher, but then you can be, you can hold prejudice against gender, okay? If you are not gender aware, if you don't um, uh, discuss uh, the prejudice against women, if you don't discuss the problems that are raised by, um, by this um, uh, prejudice and how that prejudice will come into everyday practice in your department, in your university, in making um, uh, policies, in uh, um, uh, dealing with problems, um, female um, lecturers or female student or female staff. Um, this is this is one way to to do that. Um, and the other one um, I have suggested is a law. We need to introduce new law. We improved, we improved a lot as, as uh, some of the speakers have mentioned that. And, and that is a good, good thing. And uh, therefore we need new laws. We need to uh, polish up our laws. Uh, we need to um, uh, um, sort of uh, improve our law. Um, and, and we just need to go, to go with it, with, to go with these achievements. And that we have. Um, these are these are these are the things, and um, I cannot suggest a, a concrete um, outcome from here. Uh, but um, I'm ready to uh, to be involved um, in 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 these matters. Actually, when I went back, um, that was um, in September last year. Um, I met quite um, a few people who are, um, kindly uh, provided me with information about um, in the uh, Ministry of Higher Education. Um, and um, it, it, they are all keen um, to do things, uh, but, but yet they are not, um, they cannot see that they have to involve other people to do that for them. Um, you see, um, <laughs> this is a problem. Um, you need to involve other people. Obviously, if you have to, let me be very bold here, okay? If you have established 33 gender centers, but they haven't worked anything so far, then there is a problem. Otherwise, it, 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 they would have um, laid down a policy, they would have um, had an action plan, they would have organized courses, they would have recruited people, get in fund and what have you. So that you need to um, bring other people who can do these certain things to, um, to managing these um, 33 um, gender centers. Um, I know we have advisors and they are dealing with that, but really advisors are very limited because they cannot handle it. They cannot um, do everything by themselves and they should let other people, other women, by people I mean women mainly, they should let other women um, to come forward and to do the job that required to be done for these centers um, to do their job. Thank you very much, Doctor. I have to say something else. I have a um, TV um, a meeting or TV uh, interview in about half an hour in Kurdistan. So I really need to um, to go. Um, if there isn't, if you have any other question, uh, let's do it now rather than come back to it later. If you don't have any question uh, relation to my um, uh, speech, then um, I would like to thank you very much again to Mr. Kaiwan Tahir and to yourself and to every participant. Um, I'm I'm delighted to meet you all and to hear what you had to say. And, and, and that, that this was a wonderful um, meeting and I hope um, uh, we will enjoy uh, much more meeting in, on specific topics um, and you can unite us between uh, people, um, uh, uh, qualified people from uh, UK and qualified people 
uh, within Kurdistan and we can do quite a lot um, of these meetings and uh, fruitful um, uh, solutions. So I'm going to leave you um, uh, and, and um, it was wonderful today to meet you all. Thank you very much for your contribution um, and recommendation. Uh, we look forward to hosting you and meeting you in person in the near future and discuss um, your publications uh, with, with us and um, the women in the Kurdistan region. Um, we have many questions uh, directed to all the speakers, but our timing doesn't allow us. Uh, we have extended like another three minutes, so uh, I would like to ask other speakers to contribute as well, and then uh, we will be closing uh, the webinar. Thank you very much, Dr. Osama. Um, now I would like to uh, move to a different question directed uh, to uh, Roy Dahan. As you know, diaspora are important actors in the positive developments of countries of origin. What strategies would you recommend to women to enable and engage and empower them in the diaspora? It's a very good question that caught me off guard. Um, so what strategies I would, can you so say what again? strategies would you recommend to enable and engage and empower more women in the diaspora? Yeah, so in the United Kingdom, we've got multiple uh, support groups for women to enter into parliament, um, to enter into local elections. You have 50-50 parliament, you have women to win, and they're organisations that lots of members of parliament support. They provide workshops, they provide you with peer groups, and the work they do is phenomenal. I've been um, in talks with them recently, they've taught me so much about the UK political system. So my advice would be, if you have any, um, first sort of, as Dr. Fania, you know, clarified earlier today, be clear about what you want to achieve and then you know if if you want to be uh, more involved in politics to promote women empowerment sign up and join a political party as the starting point and from there that political party has an entire support system to help facilitate your progress into politics but i also wanted to mention something uh, that dr siham said so we have lots of organizations in the uk they're much uh, they're very forthcoming to us being involved in Iraq and in Kurdistan, but they need guidance. You know, we need to know, at least I need to know, um, you know, we have MPs that want to talk to their female counterparts in Iraq and Kurdistan. They, they want to, but they just don't know how to and they don't know where to start. So I think a good idea would be, um, you know, put in place a, a, an agenda and actually communicate it to the Kurds in diaspora because Together we can achieve much more than if we all work individually. Uh, but in terms of female empowerment, I think for me at least, when I talk about female empowerment, it's not just Kurdish women empowerment, it's, it's a global thing. It, you know, women globally suffer from inequality. So there are more than one way that I, that I imagine parties in UK, in, in Germany, in France, in all over Europe and, and, and across the Western world, they're very forthcoming to engage with communities that want to have shared values and the Kurdish people have that. So I think, you know, if you want to, if you are an individual who wants to bridge both sides, go for it. But first, you know, at least understand the system on our side and then bring both sides together. We'll, we'll be doing some stuff in, in relation to this. Just watch out for our social media. We'll be trying to bring Iraqi MPs and Afghani MPs and UK MPs together to promote an agenda for female equality. Um, but that's, that's my answer for that. Thank you very much. Uh, um, now I would like to uh, move to the last question. We're running out of time. Dr. Fania, we just have one minute for you. To answer the last question, please, so how to make innovation more inclusive for women? Um, I would say, um, you know, uh, probably the best thing would be is to first off do your bit, get out and do the networking uh, and then get, you know, to the people that you think that they are your role model, see what they have done so you can follow the similar uh, footstep and get yourself out. 
uh, and possibly maybe they with the role that KRG playing nowadays is really good to see that how you get involved to getting more of the community together in the UK it's fantastic uh, in the Kurdistan I would say um, having a tech hub probably is so important for the entrepreneurs and investors to um, uh, innovators to turn up to so they can surround themselves by like-minded people because it's such a lonely journey at the beginning and it's so hard if you get the support early stages you can go much faster and develop your technology much quicker so these are some of the strategies i mean do your bit and also like if the krg here play the role um to direct them uh, to what are the opportunities available and in kurdistan having a tech hub and bring along all the you know strong-minded and leaders in the world that they can help them to develop their technology i think we as a kurdish nation we have a great um you know, powerful women uh, in there. Let, let's get them out. Let them play their role. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you very much for all the tips, experiences you've shared with us. Um, uh, we're very sorry for not being able to answer all the questions that have been directed to our participants. They have covered really important topics. I would like to end the discussion by thanking you all for joining us today. We are grateful for your uh, generous time and contribution. Your expertise and stories of success in different fields have been very inspirational. Promoting gender equality is an important part of the KRG UK's mission in the uh, UK. Kurdish women undoubtedly have made very significant progress on a great scale, but challenges still remain and more must be done to build a truly inclusive society. We hope to mark this important day uh, more broadly next year and meet you all in person. Uh, keep safe and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Bye.